As Wim said, I'm based in Dallas, Texas, and before I, get, before I go into detail about the work, I want to give a little background about me and kind of how I found my way into to art. So I, I always loved, as a kid, making things with my hands. I remember drawing the typical war scenes that most kids draw when they're kids with the airplanes and the battleships, and then moving on to all the NFL helmets. I remember as kids, we used to get these tiny little ones, probably from a machine just like that, and we would draw every 27 teams at the time, helmet, color men. Uh, that kind of led me to this epiphany or defining moment when I was 12 or 13. I remember waking up one morning and, and telling my mom, or declaring to my mom, I'm going to be an artist. I'm sure she was like, sure you are. But, but thankfully she supported this endeavor. Um, and I have these amazing teachers, middle school and high school art teachers that allowed me to kind of do whatever I wanted. I was kind of in the corner and really had the opportunity to explore and kind of find my path as far as an artist. But at come my senior year, I started kind of believing into the notion of the, the myth of the starving artist and knew of the challenges that, would, that I would face if I decided to have that path. So instead, I wasn't as brave and I started off my undergrad as a business major. Two years in, two accounting classes later, my, I guess my heart and soul started speaking to me a little louder. And I changed my major at that time to art history which I'm pretty grateful, and, and maybe this was because my mom worked at the Kimball Museum. Cool. So as a kid, I, I visited the Kimball a lot, and um, I'm thankful that I had that background, because it gave me a lot of context about all the art that's come before our time. And I had the opportunity to go and live in Florence and really kind of get immersed in culture and the fine arts there. Um, so I, after I graduated, I moved to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I knew I need, if I wanted to be an artist, I knew I needed to work in that kind of environment or that arena, as I call it. So I started working in galleries. I had a studio in my second bedroom of my apartment. I also knew that I needed more time to focus on my work. And so five years after my undergrad, I went to Cranbrook Academy of Art, which is in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, a small suburb outside of Detroit. Uh, the great thing about Cranbrook, it was modeled after the European Art Academies and built in the early 1900s by a lumberman in Detroit. Uh, the great thing about Cranbrook is it's a, it's atypical school. It's an art school only, graduate program only, 10 departments with 15 students in each department, so 150 students total. Wow. Each uh, department had an artist in residence, as they call it. So we only had one professor in each department. And instead of classes, it was like studio intensive. So we were expected to be and work in our studio. We had two critiques a week, and we had a lot of visiting artists, curators, gallery people. So it kind of exposed me to, to the art world in a different way. I moved to LA afterwards. I, I figured if, if I'm gonna have a go at this creative career, I need to either go to New York or LA. I figured LA was more suited to my personality, so I moved out there, spent five years out there, worked at a, a, a great um, art print company called Gemini GEL, who worked with some of the biggest artists today. Uh, Garrett Harper, not, not Garrett Richter, um, Roy Lichtenstein not today, Robert Rauschenberg, Richard Serra, Via Selmans, just to name a few. So I got a lot of great kind of experience there, and then I moved on to the Getty, where I worked as a um, preparator, so I installed the shows, and I also worked in uh, paper conservation. So I, I was always surrounded by the arts. Uh, I moved to England after that and lived in London for two years and found my way back to Texas in 2009 and that's when I entered academia. Because I always knew that I wanted to give back and I just didn't find an easy way to get into academia until I arrived back and I had some kind of experience and um, knowledge base that I felt that I could, or wisdom that I could impart into my students. Because I, you know, most professors go from graduate school to teaching. And so I had kind of a different experience to uh, kind of inform my students with. So a little bit about a little bit about my studio practice. So I'm always 
I see my, my studio more as a science lab, as a place for exploration and experimentation. I'm always testing things out, finding new pathways. I, I'm interested in exploring the possibilities of paint. And so I'm always finding new pathways that way. And it's almost like Bob Ross said, you know, the happy accident. So I'm always looking for those happy accidents to inform me and perhaps take me into a new direction. Um, and I see, so when I lived in Santa Fe, I, I, or when I really started my, my creative path, I was more of a figurative and landscape painter. Expressionistic and Picasso-esque in style. And it wasn't until I started reducing the landscape that I found my way to abstract painting. And I'll tell you this, I never thought I'd be an abstract painter because when I was young, going through art school in my early 20s, I, I, it didn't resonate with me. You know, looking at Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock and some of those big names in art history, it just really didn't resonate with me until I found my own pathway to it. And now I obviously love it and adore it and, and, and can't imagine another kind of way for me. As far as abstract painting, I see it as kind of like puzzle making, except you don't have the box to go by, right? You don't, you don't know where the end is, and you're starting to create something as you go, so it's you know, creating something from nothing. So what I do is try to get something down so I start to have a dialogue with the work. So the work starts informing me where to take it next. So my work, uh, sacred place, so my work uh, is about place, and I really didn't discover what my work was about until I moved to California. When I moved to California, I moved there with five blank, five foot by five foot paintings. And at that time, I was using a large trowel, about five feet, to apply the paint. Layer upon layer, it, it built this kind of physical topography of paint on canvas with this kaleidoscopic colors. A very kind of in-depth, hundreds of layers, probably two to three inches in thickness. And it wasn't until I finished that I realized that these were paintings that responded to the place that I lived in. And it was about the simultaneity going on in, in California. Everybody's on top of each other. Uh, the highways are all interconnected. So it was this kind of revelation to me. Because in, in grad school, you're always trying to find your path and your voice. And it took me a while to really kind of come to terms with that. So I see places that kind of um, entry point for my work. And I see place not only as a physical place, like a landscape, but also a psychological and spiritual place. And for me, you know, painting reconciles both of these, I, all of these three ideas, both consciously and subconsciously. And about the same time, 2015, Oaxaca, Mexico. Has anybody been to Oaxaca? Know of Oaxaca? Heard of Oaxaca? Okay. For some reason, these articles just started appearing in front of my face, you know, speaking loudly to me. And, and Oaxaca is the fourth poorest state in Mexico. It is uh, a vibrantly, uh, a vibrant place, huge history. Multi Alba and the Zapotecs used to occupy this space thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, the place is known for its food. That's where mole was, was made or created and this huge uh, creative and artistic tradition. And Oaxaca, Oaxaca is also bordered on, it's south of Mexico City and borders the Pacific Ocean. Oaxaca City is in the middle, right at the kind of epicenter of the Sierra Madres. So we have the Sierra, Sur Sierra Madres and the Norte Sierra Madres. Three valleys converge into the city, so it's just this, this beautiful, um, agriculturally rich place, kind of like the Central Valley in California. Um, so when I started doing more research, I found that there's this great uh, tradition of craft making there. And each little pueblo surrounding Oaxaca City is known for a specific craft. So all the people typically in those little pueblos have something to do with that craft, typically making it. So for example, Teotitlan is a weaving village about 30 minutes outside of Oaxaca City. Every house has a loom and we, does weavings. So they're called tapetes. And just an amazing place to go and visit because it's right in the, right the mountains and they're also known for doing lumber. So they also do have some other kind of revenue streams there. Another one's black clay pottery. Another one's red clay pottery. Uh, another one is known for their embroidery. 
The first, so I knew that I needed to go there and I did a scouting trip to make sure that I was right on my instincts. And so we went there and we, our first trip outside of the city on our second day there was to San Martin Tilcate. And San Martin Tilcate was known for their alabrigas. And all alabrigas are the carved spirit animals that you might have seen if you've gone to Mexico and have been in the airports. I never gave a second look. But when we went to Jacobo and Maria Angeles' studio, there was something that, that resonated deeply with me about it. Um, the intricate details, the way that each pattern was so like single hair brushes, and just the, the craftsmanship was so superior to what I'd seen before that I, that I knew I had to work for them. And these people are world renowned. They have over 100 people working at their studio, so it's like it's a little bubble in and of itself. I kind of, not pitched, but I kind of mentioned my idea when we met Jacobo and Maria, because you get the tour and you get to go in their studio and, and meet them. They made me a little painting, I think, of my spirit animal, which was a jaguar and a chameleon, I think. And um, we said we're coming back, and I started a, an email conversation with him and his uh, staff. It wasn't until we got back that I did the pitch. We came back and spent the summer of 2018, I believe. So our second day back, our second time back, I go back and we do the pitch to the whole family. Mom, dad, the son are there. I'm pitching. I said, we're going to have a show in Dallas. I think this is going to be a great kind of unique dynamic between a craft person and a fine artist. What do you say? They were so, our, our Jacobo, I'll say, was so excited that we started painting that day. Maria was a little less, less so. She wanted to know more specifics about how the work would be sold and where it would be sold. So that was the start of, of this. And I knew that this collaboration might be a challenge because uh, a fine artist and a craftsman have different kind of approaches. A craftsperson will do the same thing over and over and over again. You know, they, they do the carved animals, they have their little, little details that they do. A fine artist creates a unique piece every time. So it took us about a year to find some kind of synergy between my work and theirs. And I think you see some of the, the beginnings. These were some of the first pieces that were created um, in this collaboration. And what they were doing in the beginning were just placing these, these animals, you know, a fish, a fox, and these kinds of chameleon-like lizards on top of my painting. And what I was looking for was this kind of synthesis between the two. How can we really combine them to, to work more harmoniously together like you see in these? And when, when we got it after about a year, I knew that we were on to something that was, that was completely unique. The collaboration continues today, three years later. Um, so, uh, Sacred Place, uh, the title of the show, uh, when thinking of how I could put uh, my work in context with where we are here, I started looking up uh, sacred places around Lubbock. And I found a few because this is where Indians used to kind of travel through. Uh, Ransom Canyon, Yellow House Canyon, Cowhead Mesa, Llano Estacado. And that seemed like a, an appropriate place to kind of start building the, these larger scale works. But also, you know, I, I think that it also resonated for me because of my, you know, entry point into the work being placed. Because I see sacred places as being one's home, one's church, one's religion. Your sacred place can be inside your head. So I think that there are many kind of interpretations to sacred place because we can all, um, we can all relate to it to some degree. And I wanted to really well, think of the scale. I, I had this opportunity with this gigantic gallery to, to kind of be um, courageous in a way and build something or create paintings in a scale that I didn't have the opportunity to build before. And then when I went to Oaxaca, and saw the textiles or the tapetes from Teotihuacan, thinking of the similar things, or the linens that are created in a town called Mitla. It's another, you know, going back to sacred sites, I think about Molte Alban as well. 
which is a, a great Zapotec site in Oaxaca. They actually uh, flattened the mountain and built the site on top of the mountain, which is pretty amazing. So that should be a reason enough to go to, to Oaxaca and Mexico. But, but it, these are also imperfect things to be They're stitched by a seamstress uh, from Guatemala, and I intentionally tell her not to do imperfect. Because for me, you know, we're all these imperfect beings. And I wanted it to have some kind of humanity in it, too. I wanted to weave some of the threads. I didn't want them to be perfectly taught. Um, so it's always interesting to do the work and then be able to stand back and engage it and reflect upon it. And so when these bands start happening, in the beginning they meant, meant something separate to what these mean today. Because when we're kind of broken down, we have to rebuild ourselves back together. And so kind of in a way, these paintings represent that too. But I also thought about how can I use scale to talk about maybe the landscape of the Great Plains. I was born in Amarillo, Texas. I only lived there for, for a couple of years. I know it now is the truck stop capital. <laughs> um, but there's something about this expansive landscape of Texas also that interests me. And so I thought, well, how can I maybe inject a little bit of that into this work? Because I, again, the opportunity to make work of this scale was something uh, new and uh, a challenge that I wanted to have. And now I hope that I can continue to make even larger paintings than this because this really gets me inspired to see what else I can do. You know, maybe make a painting the size of this wall. Um, I don't know if you guys know much about Yano Estacado, Stack Plains. Um, it is one of the largest flatland land masses in the continent. 32,000 square miles, larger than um, New England. So those, these kinds of spaces amaze me too. So I wanted to think about that, how I can maybe inject some of that into it. And then, you know, Cal Head Mesa and Ransom Canyon. Now, I also think there's this kind of uh, beauty and simplicity. I've always been attracted to the more minimal arts to some degree. Uh, if you've been to Marfa, Texas, you know about uh, Donald Judd. Uh, if you're into minimalism, you might know about uh, Robert Irwin or, or Agnes Martin, who was an early influence on me. So I can also think that some of these early influences also impacted this later on. I remember when I was starting to try to find my voice in grad school, and advice that I give to my students today is, hey, find some of your heroes and start modeling your work after them. Because then you can start finding your own voice through that. I made, you know, 50 or 60 Gerhard Richter paintings. I remember being uh, critiqued on them all the time. Well, these are just rips on Gerhard Richter. I said, no, they're not. They're my work. But, but that's how it was. And, and uh, it gave me a, a pathway to find my own voice. Because that's the thing that I think a lot of artists struggle with. It's what's the meaning of my work and how can I find uniqueness and individuality today our differentiator today when so much has been done over the history of art. It's really hard to do. And you know, I hope that this scale can bring one in. You know, it was interesting last night watching everybody go through these galleries because this, by the way, this is an amazing thing, these first rites. I haven't seen it in any other place. Dallas certainly doesn't have it. You know, the, the galleries coordinate their openings. But we don't have the thousands of people coming through. So this was really special and a great opportunity for me to see all these different kinds of people coming through and really like looking. Gallery, opens in, uh, gallery openings in Dallas, people are going to socialize. They're not coming to look. But a lot of the people last night came to really and look. They were talking about it and they were looking. And, and I was really um, pleased with that. And I hope that they can really get involved and come up close and to look at the painting and see all the, the variety that's goes into it and try to then maybe decode the pain.